So, it's been a while since I've been to one of these meetings. I've been doing a lot of traveling. You have to um, come up with ways to pay back the amount of money that you might have spent doing certain endeavors. Uh, right before Christmas, I was in uh, Newport, South Wales, and uh, then Arras, France. Uh, and um, looking at two um, battery companies, and they need to clean their water, and so that I guess the you know the the Frenchmen are you know they they really want clean water so that they're not so stupid. But I don't know why the Welsh want to do it, but <laughs> that as it is. But the interesting thing was is that these people are really into Christmas. I mean, it was it was fantastic. It was like being a kid again, where everybody said Merry Christmas. Everybody was happy, every school, every building, every workplace, everything. I'm in Newport, South Wales, and I said, but what about the atheists? And the plant manager said, well, I'm an atheist, and I don't ever get offended when somebody wishes me Merry Christmas because it's about peace and love and happiness. And I looked at him and I said, wow, Ben Franklin was wrong. And he says, what do you mean? I said, well, Ben Franklin once said that if you're an atheist, you must be an idiot because you haven't thought about the existence of God. At which point, every person in that room went hysterically crazy laughing. It was just, it was, it was great. But they really got into the mode. It, it, and it was funny. Then, I'm now over 60, so I, I tend to do things that embarrass my son quite a bit. Uh, I go, to, I go to Walgreens and I buy all this stuff and it's for Christmas and I check out, there's about 20 items and it was just, you know, odds and ends, this and that, fill stocking stuffers, that kind of stuff. And I said Merry Christmas to the woman as I finished and she looked at me and she didn't quite know what to say. I said, it's okay. I said, you can say Merry Christmas. That's why I wear this red hat with this wreath on it with all of these, you know, Merry Christmas stuff. I said, it's okay to say Merry Christmas. So she goes, Merry Christmas. So I turn and I walk away. Well, the girl next to her, or lady, in a very loud voice, turns toward me as I'm walking away and goes, Season's greetings! <laughs> so I stopped, and I went back, and I said, Excuse me, which season are we talking about? I said, because right now it's still autumn. Are you talking about, are you wishing me a good autumn? Or are you trying to wish me a happy winter? She goes, well, well, you know, you know, uh, uh, happy holiday. Well, again, which one? I said, are we talking about Thanksgiving or Memorial? Day? Which holiday exactly do you want to? I said, listen, I said, I find it kind of bad. I know that I'm old and I know that I'm no good to a lot of you young people, but I find it very bad when you mock a customer by yelling after me after I had a very nice conversation with this lady, season's greeting. So this is what we're going to do. She goes, what's that? And I said, I want my money back. And she goes, but there's people behind you. I turned around and I said, do you mind if I get my money back? And they all doing thumbs up, because I think they had had it too. <laughs> so the woman did, she gave me my, my money back, and I said, now one final thing, just so you know it, I'm going to go to your boss, and I'm going to tell her that I'm recommending that you go to a sensitivity training on how not to mock old people who pay for Christmas stuff with cash. Merry Christmas. And I kind of walked out. <laughs> My wife was just, she's going, I'll never be able to go in the store again. My son was going, and I just went, hey, we'll all go with we'll all deal go. with it. We'll all, go with it. <laughs> all right. Article 5, Constitution. It is, Constitution's a wonderful document. And I've gone back and forth on how do we amend and how do we do and this and that. And then all of a sudden it came to me, the takeaway point. An Article 5 convention is risky. That's true. I've got absolutely no issue with that. It is risky. But the takeaway part is that doing nothing has certainty. We will lose this country. 
Now I have, I have listened to various groups, both sides, what can we do, this and that. I think we all agree, Catherine White, she and I have had a couple of good discussions. We can truly elect better people. I thought we had, but it did, didn't really turn out all that well, did it? No. But I thought we had elected better people. Not in this state. You know, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not giving up hope in this state, but not in this state. But we got to keep trying to elect better people. I think that's important. We're, done, we're doing everything we can in our power to dumb down our youth. And it's so nice to see you here, because I consider you're probably a youth. Youth, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay, good. So we've got one, and that's about it. It would be nice to have more. You don't consider me a youth, even though I'm 29? Well, no, 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 no. I don't consider you a youth. Oh. So, but we do have to educate, which means we have to talk, which means if you're against the Article 5 convention or if you're for it, it is our duty as Americans to get up and talk both sides and to get people interested in what we can do to change and how we can get going. Some people call for nullification. I think nullification is a heck of a good idea. But if we're going to nullify something, we have to take the power away. So one of the examples that Catherine gave was, I guess, the uh, New Hampshire doesn't get funds for the roads because they insist that the dumb people that want to ride around on motorcycles without helmets should be allowed to. It's their choice. So they get very little federal money for, their, for the roads. They've got nullification. I say, no, you don't. You want to nullify that? <clears throat> you need to have every gas dealer take the federal taxes from the gas and give it to the state house in Concord where they can put it in escrow and keep it from going to the federal people because all of the people of New Hampshire are doing is paying for everybody else's roads. We've gotten into this mess because the federal government takes, 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 and so now you have a whole bunch of governors and you have a whole bunch of legislatures that are going, please, please return my funds, even a portion of them. Now we can call them wimps and we can call them sellouts and we can call them all, and, and uh, yes, a lot of them are. But until nullification includes something like cutting off funds back to the federal government, Man, if I were running the business and somebody wanted to pay me and didn't want me to spend any money on their problem, I'll take it all day long. Go ahead. So see, there's a lot of working together that we can do. The John Birch Society, a lot of people have got different, different ideas, and it's good. We have to listen. We have to understand what those things are. Now, another takeaway point is something that it took me a while to come up with. Unfortunately, I've come to the conclusion that the majority of people in Washington, D.C. actually believe they are following the Constitution. Really? I really do. Where did you come up with that? Well, I came up with that. It's very simple. The people in this room, if we took a test on the meaning of the Constitution, we would probably come out that we're about 90, 85 to 90 percent originalists. In other words, we've studied and we've looked at what the words mean and we look at how they're supposed to be applied and what's supposed to happen. But what has happened over 200 years? Have the courts redefined the word, I don't know, let's take commerce. Have the courts redefined the word, say, general welfare? Yes. Yes. See, so if you look at these words that are in the Constitution, these words that weave together, these words that we were so damn proud that we were the first nation in the history of man to have a written Constitution, we might as well tear it up today because everybody's changed the meanings of the words. And stop pretending that we have something, such a perfect document. And it is. If you interpret it, the way they said it should be interpreted. Now as a group, we've been lazy over the years. We don't pass amendments to redefine terms. And really, we should. I mean, we need to pass an amendment right now. As an example, the 14th Amendment, we need to pass an amendment that redefines what it means to be a citizen. Because right now, since Jimmy Carter, we're all sitting here going, you're a citizen if you're born in this country. Bullshit. 
That's not what the Constitution says. The Constitution says you must be born or naturalized. And then there's this little short word that's called and. So it needs to be both. And subject to the jurisdiction. Now what does that mean? Very simply, if you're on vacation with your wife or your husband and you're in France and you drop a kid, is the kid a Frenchman? No, because the kid wasn't subject to the jurisdiction of France, the total jurisdiction, and he's got American parents. What gives us the right to say that these kids coming across the southern border or that woman that dropped the kid in the airplane coming from the Philippines, they convened Congress to find out where that damn airplane was to determine if the kid was an American. I already know. The kid's not an American. The kid wasn't under the jurisdiction, the sole jurisdiction of the United States government. See how we've redefined things? We've got Barack Hussein Obama as a president because we've redefined Natural born citizen. We've redefined it. Now if you look at what the framers did and the founders, they studied a little book by Emmerich or Emmer Vital called The Law of Nations. Please go look it up. Google it. Chapter 19. Read it. Find out what the definition of a natural born citizen is. You will find that it's a person born whose parents, plural, and he didn't, he didn't quite get into the transgender stuff, so I think he meant man and woman, male and female, okay? That they be citizens of that country. Then you're a natural born citizen. Now, did the framers understand that definition? I believe they did. Because the first Congress of the United States in the second session sat down and brought up to the floor a statement, again found in Vitale's book, that if an ambassador or somebody is overseas, the family, and they have a child, even though the child's born in a foreign country, that child shall be considered a natural born citizen of the United States. Now, what did we get because of that? We got Barack Obama because not one Secretary of State had the cojones to go he doesn't meet the qualifications. Now I've got, I've got news for you. If you go by that definition that they used, that they talked about in the Constitutional Convention, Marco Rubio, great guy, Bobby Jindal, great guy. Ted Cruz, great guy, they are not natural born citizens. Now that doesn't mean that we can't use great senators. We need a lot of great senators. Or we pass an amendment that redefines natural born citizen as anybody who's born here. Amen. Amen. All right? So you do it one way or the other. I don't care how you do it, but let's be honest about it. Now another thing that's happening. And then we're going to get into the meat and the potatoes. There's two ways that you can amend the Constitution. One's by Congress, the House of Representatives passing a bill, the Senate approving the bill. They send it out. It goes to, and if 75% of the states approve it, bingo, it becomes a Constitution. We have that today. We have a continuous constitutional convention. Thank you today. Every time those people go to Washington DC they're changing something regardless of what it says they are changing it. Our founders are rolling over thinking that there's a group called the IRS that makes the laws, enforces the laws, and then puts you in prison. Three branches of the government right in that bureaucracy or the EPA or the Commerce Department, or the dreaded Education Department, Department of Education. These people have completely muted everything that these people thought about 200 years ago. They were smart people. They understood that it was God's intent that all men are created free, that we have inalienable rights. That they come from God. Now, if any of you don't believe in God, fine. I don't understand it. 
But what your takeaway is, our founders believed that no government and no man could give you those rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It came from a higher being. Every time you hear our president say the, the Disabilities Act grants these rights, it's bullshit. The Disabilities Act doesn't grant anything. It might give you a privilege, but it doesn't do rights. So after thinking of it in that terms and thinking of it and going long and back and forth and this and that, I realize we're in a constant constitutional convention. I know that George Soros and a bunch of other dingbats have applied to go and do a convention of the states. And my answer to that is, go for it, George. Because right now he's doing it behind our back, buying off politicians and bureaucracies. I would rather it be out in the open, or at least a chance to be transparent. And I don't think that George Soros and some of these other liberal iconic groups really care about a constitutional convention because they're getting everything they want today. They're screwing all the people that work. They're taking away their happiness. And happiness is not hedonistic type happiness. Happiness is moral value. Okay, virtue, spirit, jobs, keeping what you make to take care of your family. That was the definition of happiness when you look at it back in those days. We've changed that definition too. So, I came full circle. Now one of the arguments that I've heard is that the Constitutional Convention was kind of rigged and it was probably a runaway convention. And for those that believe that, I'm sorry, you really shouldn't even be thinking about upholding a Constitution if you truly believe that. But some people do. So let's explain how we got there. You had 13 colonies established by charters, legitimately. Think of them, if you will, not quite the same analogy, but 13 independent and sovereign countries. France, Britain, Germany, independent, sovereign countries. Massachusetts people didn't like New York. It's been going on for a long time, okay? New Jersey people thought the people in South Carolina had weird accents. It's been going on for a long time. These, these, these colonies, these countries fighting. But what they did do over 150 years by having this authority figure across the ocean was they started doing things themselves. They didn't have Game Boys. They didn't have all this other stuff, so they read. One of my favorite new guys that I really like is George Mason. I put on colonial gear and I'll talk with an accent and pretend I'm George Mason. He read over 1,700 books preparing for the law. And none of the books were court cases. It's amazing, isn't it? He read Cicero and he met all these great things, all these liberal, all these true classical liberals. And that's how he formed his ideas. He read some in Greek, he read some in Latin, he read some in French, French, he read some in German, some in Spanish, and some in English. Most of the founders and framers had good language skills, five, six different languages. It was amazing. I can't even comprehend how you could do that. But they came up with an idea of natural law, that we come from God, we're made in his image. And because we're made in his image, we're allowed to think and we have reason. And if we do that right, we create something called laws that are just and uniform for everybody. And because man makes a compact with other men and chooses to join in a society, those laws establish a commonwealth where men work together. And indeed, the best duty of man, not government, but of man, is to be respectful and compassionate of other men. And they mean women too when they say that. They just sort of shorthand it because they had those ink pens that didn't hold a lot of ink. So, you know, they, they kept the word short. The final thing's kind of interesting. Even Ben Franklin wrote about it. Someday when he dies, he's got to go in front of the man and he's going to be asked why he voted a certain way. I always thought that was kind of an interesting take on natural law. That's what founded the Declaration of Independence. What preceded the Declaration of Independence was George Mason. And I know this is old English, but I kind of think it's cool. I know some people might fall asleep. 
or I've, I've been told, all men are by nature equally free and independent, and they have certain in inherent rights of which, when they enter into a state of society, they cannot, by any compact, deprive or divest their posterity. In other words, they can't give it away. These are your rights. You cannot give away your rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You cannot do it. Namely, the enjoyment of life and liberty with the means of acquiring and possessing property and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. He got most of that from John Locke, some of the others. Thomas Jefferson borrowed from him and John Locke. In fact, the founders were very famous in borrowing from people, unlike our current vice president. They actually gave credit to those to whom they borrowed stuff from, <laughs> which is kind of an amazing fact. That's called virtue. That's called morals. Amen. Okay? The takeaway note, and, and I think as a society we're forgetting it, and maybe that's why we sometimes forget how to fight. Our rights come from a being far greater than us. They do not come from government. Right. Ever. They come from a being far greater than we are. That's what happened. We get the Declaration of Independence. We decide to, to unite against a common enemy. Four states drove the War of Independence. Massachusetts, we all know that, we live here. Connecticut, Virginia, big time driver, and the final one was South Carolina. New Jersey, New York, eh, Rhode Island, eh, you know, Maryland. They didn't really get all, Georgia didn't quite know what to do with peanuts yet, so it couldn't get involved, you know, so four, four colonies, four states, four countries drove the fight. They were also key in getting the Articles of Confederation, where we have an EU, right? That's kind of like an Articles of Confederation. You have sovereign countries, they come together, they have certain things that the EU does. It's funny, the EU doesn't do any of them well, but that's okay. So we had an Articles of Confederation, it came together, it had some flaws. It was a pretty good idea, except what it did was, it didn't address the fact that Maryland was screwing the people in Virginia when they'd trade goods across the Chesapeake Bay. Or when Massachusetts would go across the Hudson after sneaking into New York, or, or this or that. So there were these divisions that the Articles of Confederation couldn't take care of. And in fact, the Articles of Confederation made it where the people were, yeah, they're kind of, but it's we the states. You see, the Declaration of Independence didn't say anything about states. It said man. So whatever that grant is of liberty, it's not from the states to the federal government. The grant is really from the people through the state to the federal government. Again, the takeaway is our rights come from God, from the Almighty. So we almost lost the American Revolution, not because we couldn't fight, not because we couldn't cheat and be and get behind rocks and do all sorts of stuff that we learned in different wars and stuff. We couldn't get the money. Hey, Rhode Island, could you spare some money? No, 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 we're partying down on the beach. We're watching the yacht sail. You know, they, it, so we didn't get anything from them. North Carolina didn't know what the heck to do. So all of these different things, there was no real way to get money. Unfortunately, a government needs money. And we better pray that we go back to a limited government because a out of control government can't ever get enough money. So we signed the Articles of Confederation and now you had the commerce problems. So they, the states, and the states have been having conventions for years and years. If you like them, if they're risky, whatever. The people that go to these, we used to have a moral fiber, I know we don't anymore, where the people that went had a fiduciary requirement to do what was in the best interest of the people, not their party, not their special interests, but the party. It was a fiduciary inside. Now they could do their votes, this and that. So if they went to, the, they went to a convention, they understood that in the Declaration of Independence it says that 
All men are created equal and endowed by the creator of certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that power comes from the consent of the government, and then if all else fails, you have the right to just get rid of the government and establish a new one for your happiness and safety. Those five truths go together. They stay together. That's part of the fiduciary. You can't just say, I'm going to change the government and forget the rest. They believe that. I still believe that. I think the majority of Americans actually believe that too. You can't just go change it. Now we have a president that wants to, but he's already failed the Constitution because he wasn't a natural born citizen. So they got together in, in Annapolis, the Annapolis Convention, in, oh, I'm going to say September of 18, 1786. And the whole purpose of that discussion was, how can Virginia trade with Maryland across this little body of water called the Chesapeake Bay? And within three days, the delegates that were sent by five states, okay, all 13 were notified and asked to come, five states sent. They decided there's no way we can fix this unless we do something for the government. So they sent a summary of the meeting to the 13 states as part of a confederation and to Congress recommending that in May and the next year we hold something to look into changes, to, to fix the flaws, to improve it for our posterity. They had a series of votes. The final vote came from Rufus King, I believe, I believe and, I, and I might be wrong on that, so I'll just state that I'm wrong on it right now. But what they did was, I'm not going to read it all because it's in, it's in good English and I don't have a costume on so you wouldn't get the accent, you know, if I read with the script, okay? But it basically says, Several states will be held in Philadelphia for the sole purpose of revising the Articles of Confederation and reporting to Congress and the several legislatures such alterations and provisions, and then the key wherein shall, when agreed to in Congress and confirmed by the states, this is the key point, render the federal constitution adequate to the exigencies of government and the preservation of the nation. They left the door wide open as to what could happen to the, to the Articles of Confederation. So, 12 states, really only 11, and then you had Alexander Hamilton from New York. Rhode Island didn't really want to get involved. They, they were down watching the yacht races. They meet and they discuss things. They knew every single period, period everything associated with the Constitution when they were putting it together. They had a two-day argument over a semicolon versus a comma. Now, today, Congress operates under the illusion that that comma is a semicolon because they just want to raise money and then they want to do with whatever they want to with it. But indeed, it wasn't a semicolon, it was a comma, so the only time they could raise money was to pay bills. Kind of a different approach, wouldn't you say? It's a very different approach, but they had a, they had a fight over that. Governor Morris almost got censured not quite, but he, he was, they had some very strict words with him sneaking that little extra dot in. A dot. <laughs> they knew every word. It was written in terms of a contract of the 1780s, the 1800s, if you will. We the people, big flourish, right? If you read pro proclamations from England, you'll go, King George, big and flowery. In the Constitution, it's we the people, big and flowery. That's the way it was. You can go into the points. The points after they did this, they had this convention and stuff. Every single point was debated. People, Delaware got on board really quick. Connecticut got on board really quick. Georgia got on board really quick. And then it kind of slowed down, especially New York, even Virginia. Patrick Henry was great. So you started a series of things called the Federalist Papers. And the Federalist Papers came out and they said all sorts of things, even though about five states had already ratified it. Because again, when they finished this debate, they sent this to all 13 legislatures and said, this is our recommendation. They sent it to Congress. Congress forwarded again 
to the 13 legislatures. All 13 legislatures said yes, and they set up ratification conventions. They accepted the document. Now we're going to see if we accept the document. But we've accepted the premise, and then they voted. It took Rhode Island and New uh, North Carolina a long time. But they finally ratified. And the definitions of every single word can be found in the Federalist Papers, probably the most dry reading in the history of man. But every single thing that was debated, they'd ultimately go to the Federalist Papers to find out what it truly meant. Not the Anti-Federalist Papers, but the Federalist Papers. And the people in Delaware and Maryland and Georgia and Connecticut, all the ratifiers, they never came back and said, oh, I didn't think it meant that. Even though these Federalist Papers were after these states had already ratified and said we're going to start. Now there was one thing toward the end. My friend George Mason, who I really admire, he did not own, he did not sign the, the, the Constitution. He was one of the premier people of thought. Edmund Randolph, who was the governor of Virginia, he didn't sign either. In fact, he came up with the Virginia plan. In the Virginia plan, they knew that you needed to be able to change the Constitution because we're men. It's not going to be perfect. And so the plan then was the states change it. Well, then you have the big government people and they kind of take over and they kind of move the states out and it's just going to be the natural legislature. Now, I will read this as to what Mason did say. Because he thought it was very, very important that you can't, well, I'll read it. As for amendments, they will be necessary. As you see, the Constitution will be defective as we put it on trial. Okay? It will be better to provide for them in an easy, regular, and constitutional way than to rely on chance or violence. It would be improper to require the consent of the natural national legislator because they may abuse their powers or refuse their consent on that very account. For no amendments of a proper kind would ever be obtained by a people if government should become oppressive. And that's when they came back in and said, the states are closer, the people are closer to the states than they are to the federal. The only chance may be that we rely on the people themselves acting through the states to save the Union. That's the takeaway. That's what they believed. They discussed nullification. They never wrote the word in the Constitution. It was, it's been tried a couple times. They discussed education. Of course, we've blown that. They discussed that in the Northwest Ordinance, saying it was very important to teach all kids morality, virtue, and religion. <laughs> Boy, the top three. Science didn't even get mentioned in the top three. That's how it went together. So now we're at a quandary. How do we go forward? There is a lot of corruption in Washington, D.C. I do think that a lot of people understand that they're not living up to the true words of the Constitution, but they're always going to come back and say, but it's okay, almost like Lindsey Graham. Let's let the courts decide. What a ding bat. I, I mean, really. Please. The courts have made some great decisions, haven't they? Yeah. You know, Dred Scott, that was a winner. Boy, that was just, boy, that was great. Okay? Brown Percy, that was a good one. Who was the guy that was growing wheat, but he couldn't use it on his own farm during the, during the FDR thing, and they did that? There was another Jewish fellow in New York selling chickens and he'd let the people pick which chicken they wanted him to cut up and they closed him down. Oh, you can't do that. That's against commerce. They redefined the word commerce. The hotel in Atlanta. The, there's all sorts of stuff. It is corruption. It is for the thing. So maybe we do need to try something. Nullification, yeah, but we got to go after the root cause. I'm getting to the point now where I truly believe we either go after something in a strong, strong way or the next step's going to be revolution. We're on, we're on a teeter-totter right now so close and I do not want violence. 
But we're so close. And George Mason said it right here. We don't want to rely on chance or violence. Maybe this is the only way. I know the John Birch Society says it's risky. Yes, it is. But with certainty, if we continue on this course, we're not going to be able to, to overturn it. Now, I'm not going to rely on Massachusetts to do squat. Okay? I will tell you that 32 of the 50 states are controlled by Republicans. What kind of Republicans, I don't know. But I do know that as you go from Washington, D.C. to more local, you become more conservative. Well, except for G squared and Golnick. But that, besides that, and I, I'm not carrying a grudge. <laughs> but you have to look at these things in terms of what can fix it. Okay? We can educate, we can do whatever. All right? So, I think I pretty much covered up. Could there be a runaway? Oh, yeah. In my mind, there can't be a runaway. The bar is so high. 32 of 50 states are controlled by Republicans. Nebraska makes it 20, 33. You need three more states to put articles in. Per the historic perspective, and I know we wiped that out. I understand that. Congress can't look at this one, this one, and if they're on two different subjects, they can't call it together. I think the majority of conservatives understand that if they even attempt to do a balanced budget amendment, it would by necessity to pass the states and get 75% of the states to validate it. It would have to curb spending and put a ceiling on taxes. Because you can have a balanced budget, as, as one of the guys said, I think you, and I agree with you. You can have a balanced budget, balanced budget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you going to do with the spending? Let's get back to a limited government first. Okay? I don't think it could be run away because any 14 states could stop it. Now, could they change the rules and stuff? I don't think it would be tolerated. There's too many good people in the United States that if we all pulled together and started to educate, right now they're saying that 55% of Americans believe that abortion's wrong. Now in the 60s and 70s, I'm not sure we would have even thought that was possible. And yet it's evolved. Maybe people are getting fed up. I, I'm not going to trust Boehner. I'm not going to trust O'Connell. McConnell, sorry, whatever. I just make it, is that Scotch and the old Boehner's Irish? Yeah, let's insult the Scotch, but, you know? So I don't know, but I'm in favor of it. I'm in favor of it big time. Would I ever be elected to be a legislature to go? No, <laughs> not in this state. But I guarantee I'll write some great documentaries, whatever. So we went over what's been tried historically, how do you go, the words that was used, how it works. So what are some amendments we could agree on? It was funny, I was talking to the head, I said, why not instead of scaring the living bejeebies out of everybody and saying we're just going to open it up like they did the Bill of Rights? Where did the Bill of Rights come from, by the way? There was a threat of a convention. Yeah. I want to say Rhode Island. There was another. Oh yeah, it was every state. There were four. There was a big four that well, said we were not going to sign it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 that part. But they wanted to have a convention because they wanted the Bill of Rights. The way they set up the Constitution, it was we the people give you the power to run the states this way, but you can't do anything to the people. And they thought in the parlance of that day, you didn't have to state it. Okay, there was a big thing. Anyway, Madison came over to the right side. But they threatened to have a constitutional convention, and, and you'll hear opponents of, of the Article 5 going, and Madison was against it in Washington. Yeah, they all were. They'd just gone through. It's kind of like I've been saying, how can you fix the immigration law if you don't use it and find out what's broken? And Madison and Washington were kind of saying, how do we know what's broken in the Constitution if we haven't even started yet? So basically, all 13 states gave ideas to Madison and this and that when he put together, presented 17 amendments to the House of Representatives. They approved some, or uh, no, the, he, he presented, 
it was like 70 amendments to the House of Representatives. They approved 17. That went to the Senate. The Senate approved 12. It went to the states. The states approved 10. There was no order to them. As they came up, that's how they were. The first two of the 12 weren't approved. That's why the First Amendment's freedom of religion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was never number one. It was always number three. Okay? But that's what they did. So indeed, a convention or a threat of convention actually got Congress to do what Congress needed to do. A threat of convention actually got the we could drink booze revised mm -hmm. because we started going. There's also a hearsay that says a threat of a convention is the reason why the women's rights movement got going. I think there were other reasons why it got going, which I can't say now because we're in mixed company. But if I was just with guys, I would say what I really thought it was. But we're not. It always amazes me in women's rights movement, they never used a judge. They never used a judge. Can you imagine that? It was a grassroots from the ground up and they never used a judge. They never went to court and they got what was inherently correct and right. It's amazing, isn't it? So, what can we agree on? What, what are amendments we can agree on? We can agree on term limits. Most of the state legislatures are a little flaky about that because they have a feeling that if we got term limits, <laughs> it might go back on them. In fact, we had a judge turn over term limits for a couple of the states that tried it. But I think term limits, I was once against term limits. I really was. And now I just see the corruption and stuff. And I don't think, it can, I don't think you can get around it. So I think it's good. But you know the other people I want term limits for? Every federal judge, you got 20 years and you're out of Dodge. That's a lifetime appointment. If you look at when they wrote the Constitution, they never thought somebody would be wise enough to be a judge and then live for as long as, I don't know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who I really admire because anybody that's going to get snockered to go to the State of the Union, I give her, I give her kudos. I think that was fantastic. <laughs> but that's something we can agree on. The other thing I'm getting really tired of, I don't know about you, when five people with the same DNA as I have tell me what I need to do. Now, there's just something inherently wrong with the Supreme Court decision five to four where the American people are against something and yet the American people in Congress and the President can't say anything because Marbury and Madison actually said the Supreme Court's one of their main roles is to see if it's constitutional. What if the states, what if 60%, what if, what if 30 of the states said no, no to Obamacare, and it was removed from the books? You can't make change easy. A constitutional, a, a state convention to amend the Constitution is not easy. I don't even know if it's going to work. I don't even know if we could get around to doing it, it's so hard. You can't make rule of law change by any whim. It's got to be hard. And it's got to be permanent. The problem is right now, we don't really know what course we're on because everybody keeps changing the words. Yes? You said it. You used the word threat. Mm -hmm. It's a threat of convention. The women's rights movement threatened a convention. People threatened. I think what is necessary is a threat not violence, but a threat of violence. In other words, people going into the State House, um, I don't know if anybody's been following this thing going on in Washington where uh, the Sipsy Street, the regulars, that guy, I forgot his name, not on top of my head now, but he went and Washington, they were going to march into the State House with firearms because it was loud or whatever. And one of the Washington State legislators said, they're threatening us with firearms. And they said, yeah, we are. If you are, don't, are not threatened by something, eternal okay. damnation, okay. Um, something like that, then you can make these judgments, you can make these rules, and not be afraid of the consequences, because they're good consequences for you. It has to be, like you said, a moral fiber. I mean, what, what is a moral fiber? It's the threat you're going to hell if you do something immoral. 
Well, we've definitely. lost we've lost a lot of the threats. I don't know. Let me summarize. I think we need to attack restoring this country to its founding principles on all fronts. That means education. That means talking to your children, talking to your parents, talking both sides, plus or minus. I think when we sit there and we go, no, it won't work and it's going to fail, I think that, that does a disservice. I don't know how you can revere the Constitution but then go, that part doesn't really work. You know, because they did give us in Article 5 an alternative way to amend the Constitution. It's kind of like saying, oh, well, I like the Constitution except that assembly clause. That's kind of, eh, don't like that. See, this document was well thought out. And it was brought to us and given to us as our birthright, if you will. It does need some improvement. I do think nullification, I think there's things we can nullify, but we got to have the cojones to cut the funding going back to Washington, D.C. And I think they'll really get upset if you stop sending money. Now, I joked with Catherine White, and it's terrible. <laughs> she was saying as an example of great nullification was the fact that Massachusetts has a marijuana, medical marijuana thing, even though the feds say no. I came up and said, yeah, Catherine's saying that if we have medical marijuana in all 50 states, none of us will give a damn about the Constitution. <laughs> but, and she kind of looked at me and I kind of went, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. But I mean, again, the fact that we do it and the fact that the President likes his reefers and so does the Attorney General, there, as, as long as we do it and there's no consequence to them, okay, we don't care. There's got to be consequences to our actions. I don't know if we can restore the country. I don't know. I, I know that Obama and company are doubling down and they're trying everything they can to move. And I thought we would have it a whole lot better with the Republicans we brought together. But then again, it goes back to the old adage, you've got progressives as Democrats and you have progressives as Republicans. They're both progressives. Theodore Roosevelt was probably one of the greatest progressives, the Republican, followed shortly thereafter by Woodrow Wilson, another great one. So the only thing you can do is preach the thing. Preach what natural law is. Preach what our birthright is. Our rights. That's it. That's basically the what I wanted to say. I'm trying to do both. You know up front which side I I think the John Birch Society has got good ideas as well. Yes, it is risky. But with all certainty, if we don't do this risky move, I believe we're going to lose our country. So I will open it up to questions. Now, because it's being filmed, oh, Carrie took care of it. I can read the question. Yeah. Um, there's a um, website called the Convention of States Action. Mm -hmm. According to that website, 26 states have already signed up uh, for, they filed a, a, a convention of, of states resolution in 2015. Yeah, to limit federal power. One of the things that bothers me is that the first one listed is Massachusetts. But I'm not sure that Massachusetts approved that. I think, I think it was well, presented. By the website, Massachusetts is one of them. New Jersey is another, Pennsylvania is another, Oregon is another. These are all liberal states. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm worried about those states over um, to when the convention. About that, well, about Washington, D.C. Yeah, I understand. Which is worse? But for out of 10 states? If, if the states don't use um, the... Um, what is it called? The, uh, uh, nullification. nullification. What makes you think they're going to do the right thing in the convention? Conventions I mean, they ball haven't ball. got the balls to use nullification. See, do they have the balls to change the, the Constitution the right way? I, I, I don't know. Now, I'm not, I, I haven't made a decision myself on which one 
I, I, you, need, you need to think about it. My answer to it is our Constitution is changing every single day because of Washington, D.C. I understand that. I and agree with that. We can do about it. I agree with so that. I'm, I'm, I'm taking the dice right now, and I don't think it's that big of a risk to start educating people and to get people talking about it and to keep coming up with ideas that they like. And maybe at some point the threat will be enough to get them to do the right thing. But I'm not sure that Boehner and Connell and company, the threat will do anything. Yes. There is another problem, however. Um, what happens if you get a state coming together with a They have a single purpose to start with. People can't agree. And then you start hearing the ugly word, compromise. And I can see compromise cutting some very valuable freedoms off the top. Like, do we really think the press should be free? I mean, ISIL is using all these free press things to recruit. There'll always be a reason, there'll be an excuse, mm -hmm. and compromise becomes a magic word, and I can't understand why it is viewed today as magic in Washington, but it is. The greatest document ever Sorry. created in the history of man based on compromise. Can we bring those guys back? Well, yeah, I'm here. Well, all right, so <laughs> there's other people. <laughs> now we just have to get them to the convention. Yes, and I'll rely on Texas and Florida and Oklahoma to send good people. Because I think they will. Indiana, I think they will. I think they will. Again, to get a consensus, to get two-thirds to agree on something, and then to get three-quarters to vote on it, it's going to be hard, yes. Um. I think personally that the convention's a little risky, but it has the goal to minimize the government. I think that auditing and exposing the Fed, abolishing the Fed and going for the fair tax is, it would accomplish the same in a sense, but it's less risky. So I think putting our efforts towards a movement like that might have more success and less risk. Have you studied the President Obama? Okay, and, and, and I'm, I'm going to answer your question. Does he want to change immigration? Does he want to change taxation? What about the EPA? What about his energy strategy? Has he really backed away from attacking us on every single point around the compass? Yeah. Yeah. So, to answer your question, yeah, that's the bonus. Let's work on fair tax. We're going to work on fair tax. We want to make sure that we work on limited government. Well, we'll but on every single point we can attack and try to restore this country, those are all the points we should be attacking. We should not let them rest. I made a point, I made a post the other day that I was very upset. I was disappointed in Ted Cruz because he lied to the American people. He said that if we don't do something, the Democrats are going to shut down Homeland Security. And that's a lie. Homeland Security, 83% are essential personnel. They might not get paid, but they're going to be at work, no matter what happens. <clears throat> so the correct way to get to the American people is, listen, we want to fund Homeland Security. If they don't, that's fine. we still got 83% essential personnel coming in, and it will stand for the fact that the Democrats want this illegal immigration to proceed. That's the only reason they're not supporting it. See, that's a better argument than we don't want to shut down the federal government. We couldn't shut down. So, I'm with you. I think the Fed is a disaster and always has been. Every president that wanted to get rid of the Fed or go back to hard currency was either assassinated or they tried to kill him. So, it's kind of interesting. It's obviously a movement right now, but I think it's... Get behind it. Pick, you can't get behind all of them, but if you can get five, six, seven of your friends, because it's your wallet, when you, you're not going to have anything unless we fix this when you get older. This will still be a great country. My first debate with Catherine White, I went outside and a bunch of kids came out and they said, did you win? I go, it's not about winning, it's about getting people to think. I said, what do you think about this country? That's the greatest country in the world. I said, yes it is. I said, I'm about 40 years older than you guys. 
I don't even have to show an ID when I go in a bar. I said, but in my 40 years, I can tell you that this country was once greater. I can list rights and things that I could do that I didn't have to worry about that kept costs down and this and that that incited people to start their own businesses. And yet, 40 years later, I've seen how much we lose. You still think this is a great country. I said, the funny thing is, my grandparents used to tell me about how once great the country was until the 60s. How wonderful is freedom and a people believing that their rights come from God and that government's sole purpose what makes this country exceptional, what makes our American, American exceptionalism is the fact that this is the first country in the history of man that was created where a government was created to protect our God-given rights. That's American exceptionalism. That's where it came from. That's what it does. And our God-given rights, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, one of the things that Congress is supposed to protect is patents, copyrights. How many patents and copyrights have been created by 3% of the world's population over those so many years? The only answer is it's got to be our freedoms. Chinese are just as smart as we are. Germans are. Well, we won't talk about the French, but you know, it, 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 it's, it's that type of thing. All right? That's it. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> um, I sit in Starbucks with this on my computer, and I get I get people who come to me and ask me about the U.S. Constitution. And one of the things I tell them is I say, "Okay, how many rights does the U.S. Constitution give you?" Back and forth, back and forth, and say, well, I'm being in. It's easy. Oh, so it's a trick question. No, you've been tracked. That's a trick question. The point is that the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, does not give you any rights at all. None whatsoever. It creates a federal government and then reminds the federal government why human man has certain of these rights. It specifically in the ninth and 10th makes it clear that the Bill of Rights is not a complete compendium of the rights. And I tell them, I say that it is, you don't have the freedom of religion because the Constitution gives it to you. So, um, you, you have the freedom of religion. The freedom of religion is a reminder of the, the, to the people. So I agree with you, we need education. Mm -hmm. And we need people to understand what's going on. That's probably crucial. And then she opened her mouth and had to respond. This is the threat. This is the threat we need. What would happen if tea parties across the country began saying, you know what? We're forming our own currency. Because the Constitution says coining doesn't refer to paper money. So but like, coining, per the definition, when you look it up, is paper money. They, they've attached it. So what, but see, that's the threat. What if people decide, we're going to go back to the gold? Well, Al Capone tried that, though, and he went to jail. <laughs> <laughs> but I get your point. There are, yeah, I mean, threats are very important. Maybe that is not the best one. But one of the things that needs to be done is the federal government needs to step back. No, wait a minute. Hold it, hold it. People are getting a little riled here. And you, you said it yourself. Barack Obama is not backing down from any of his points. No. Um, that's because he's not threatened. He's not afraid. He feels he Nothing sees the goal. Nothing to lose. He sees the light at the end of the tunnel. It's right there. All he's got to do is reach out and grab it. I do not believe that 22 million people working for the federal, state, and local governments are going to back down. Their livelihoods depending on me going to work. Now I know there's a lot of good people. There are jobs that we definitely do need people to do within government. But I don't know that we're gonna we, we, we have to get into back there. Oh yeah. 
but I think we need a convention to pass the law because there is nothing which we set the consequence of a state convention if against the wildest dream it actually went correct and we got 75% of the states or 66 to agree and 75% to ratify and they pass a resolution that says judges are limited to 20 years and we're going to start taking them off every two years, the top 20, the next 20, the next 20 percent until we get them in from where they're going. There's nothing they can do. There's nothing they can do. They can try to ignore it if they can, but they can't because they release chaos. I got... Your name is? Ronald Jude Benry Jr. aka RJ. <laughs> RJ. I got few questions. Do you think we could have a chance to have the amendment to repeal the IRS? The IRS? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you, I, I, you don't need an amendment to repeal the IRS, per se. But if you did a fair tax or a balanced budget, then everything, <coughs> this is how much I made, and I'm going to multiply it times 65% and send in the check. 65 would be too big, but yeah, then you don't need an IRS. And also, um, I've been talking with my some of my family about the convention of states, and most of them said it was a pretty good idea. I asked them to look up on the website of conventionofstates.com and see it for themselves. It's good. It's good articles. Everybody needs to read both the pro and the con. And we have to wait. Yeah. And like I said, we I think we go everywhere. You take a World War II strategy, and you attack them on all fronts. All fronts. One Any more thing. I wait a minute. I only got one more okay. thing. Okay. Right. Um, raise your hand when you talk about currency, like having your own currency. What do you mean, raise your hand? Bitcoins, for example. Oh, how do you know? I've, I've heard the, those um, people mean when they say the other currency. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I was talking about, like a reflection of Bitcoin. The Tea Party could have their own cryptocurrency to right. threaten. I think the Berkshire dollar is a good example of that. Oh, yeah, I learned about that, too. Berkshire. Well, I'll have to look it up. I, I have no share. All I know is current currency makes sure that when I do a job for you, you're going to make me a pie so I cut your grass. But now you don't have time to make me a pie, so you give me a certificate that I can give to you, and you don't have time either, but you'll do something for me so I can give it to the baker. <laughs> so that's what currency is for. Yes? Um, I don't know how many people in here know you as well as I do. Uh -oh. don't, don't say it like that, because this is on film. That's, yeah, that's, that's on film, right. But I, w I was part of the, uh, the group that brought you in and know that you, you teach the Constitution so that you are accredited to be able to have scouts get their badges for that. That's a background that not many people have. Okay. I want people to know that. So my concern is... Um, that with the population of today, as far as the government is concerned, there are many there who ignore the Constitution. So that my concern is to try and change amendments, they're not going to care. They're not going to care. But as a constitutional person, is there anything in the, that paperwork right there to be able to say what was initially um, developed to be able to stop, uh, to protect the three branches, to be able to stop some of the stuff that's going on that's illegal. If it's illegal, there has to be some way to be able to stop that without having a convention, which most there will ignore, or others who are also with that mindset you just come you in and could, pull it apart. You can impeach the president, you can impeach judges, you can do a lot of that. But that takes, that takes more fortitude. That's like communism. That, that's, you know, that type of thing. 
once you start going down a path where they change the definitions, you're going to find as many judges that say it's okay to do that as you'll find that it's not. I mean, Thomas is absolutely, if you've read any of his stuff, he is a brilliant person. Scalia, brilliant person. But they do, they do, they read the Vitals and the Blackstones and this and that. They have their Moe's dictionary like I do, which is that's a really interesting. When you look up some of the words you use, Noah's got some really different definitions that I never thought meant in reading this. But back in 1790s, they all knew what those definitions were. Go ahead. Yes, I would like to make a comment or two uh, and uh, maybe get your reaction. I believe that the thing, and this just came to me a couple of years ago, the thing that people should learn from history is that ever since the beginning of the human population on this planet, there have always been some human beings that wanted to have power over a, a, an abundance of human beings. And it's never changed. We've had emperors, we've had conquerors, we've had dictators, we have kings, queens, on and on and on. And that's what's existing today. And I also believe that we have to educate as many people as we can to this fact. And that the other thing is that um, unless we can get enough people to get off their backsides and go to the polls and vote, and vote out every incumbent in the place, everything else isn't going to work. We've talked about that for years. Yeah, and I, I, I don't know whether I anything else will work. It can, I don't know that it can, I, I wish it would happen, but I don't think it can. That's why it took me a long time to, to come out and in favor of term limits. Right. I have a few comments. And the biggest one is beware, because the Constitutional Convention is like a giant rat trap. And you're the rats. There, are, there was one word you haven't heard, and it's the bait. The word is fairness. They will stick it to you. They want you to call a Constitutional convention. They, you know how long it'll last? About two weeks. Because it's already been written. Bloomberg, Soros, the rest of these people have already written your next constitution. They're just waiting for you to open the door. Fairness. Well, we've got to have equal representation. 50% male, 50% female. Racially divided the way your state looks. And don't forget those illegal people. No really illegal people. They need representation. They should have a vote. And the conclusion of the Constitutional Convention and the ratification by three quarters of the state, all persons now living in the United States shall be deemed citizens. Okay. Okay, now where's your facts? Be careful what you ask for. Where's your facts? asked for a constitutional convention to fix the Articles of Confederation. They thought they were going to get a little tweaking and a few extra paragraphs. No, they didn't. You haven't read your history, Mike. They got the whole new constitution. You don't read your history. Well, I've read enough of they it. Had, they had many, many problems within the state that needed to address. They knew that very, it was going to be a big revision. Very, very careful what you ask for because it's coming to you rapidly in pretty ribbons and pretty paper, and the minute you get there, you don't think anybody in this room would get to go to a constitutional convention. It would be the same scum we've sent to Washington, the same scum we've sent down to Beacon Hill, and what are they going to do? They're going to make sure that they will be in power for the rest of their lives and their children and their children's children. Be very careful what you ask for. And be very careful with people who say, we have to do it because if we don't, we're going to fall off the edge of the earth. You know, yes, this country is in a crisis, and yes, it's getting worse. And the mechanisms there are there 
to slowly turn us into a socialist country. The Constitutional Convention is not a quick fix and it's not a magic bullet. Teaching your kids and your grandkids about God and history will get us a lot more done. Yes, it will. I agree with you on that. But I also know that we're headed right now with the bad constitutional convention. We're already there. Because it's happening every day. Yes. I just wonder what you think about the education of our children today. It's too... Uh, I think it stinks. I think because what I'm seeing, the problem today, is that we don't teach our children to think. And when I talk to college students that I, I know, that they will say, well, my professor said, they don't think for themselves and they're not being taught how to think. Creativity is stifled in our schools. Oh, somebody's a little nervous, well, we've got to give them some medication because they have attention deficit syndrome. A lot of these children years oh, ago no. were the ones they that the they had, well, those are the children a lot of them years ago that had the genius in certain areas of creativity also, you know, and we strive for that. We, and I don't know if you have any ideas of how, how do we go about changing this movement of, um, you have a lot of people. You have you have a lot of people making money with the NEA and coming out of Washington D.C. It was never in the. It was never a duty given to Congress to take care of education at all, even in the close. But they did anyway because it was, as Mike would say, it was fair. We got to let the inner city kids get better in this event. Education is the primary part. The primary people that need to educate. Our parents, and we've made a society where the majority of parents both have to work. So you have the minority breadwinner and the minor breadwinner. The minor breadwinner is making enough money to take care of daycare and to pay for the two-week vacation and pay the extra taxes. So now we create a thing for the students to learn. I don't know how we, I don't know how you fix it. I I think that the Department of Education is giving us a and waste of money. And if Alabama wants to have stupid people, fine. That's still right. Another genius of the Republic. They're going to keep a lot of the Republican government. Okay? Last question. Last question. Go ahead. I just want to address what uh, Linda said. Uh, she asked about what's in the Constitution to, pr to protect people people, uh, or to make people follow the Constitution. The separation of powers was intended to do that, but unfortunately, it depended on the moral character of the people in those separate legislations. That's gone. It, it, they don't have any morals anymore, so we can't depend on that. The separation of powers is not working because, you know, it, it was supposed to be that people would not give up their section of the power. So that, that's not working. They're, they're, they're dumping it all on onto the, to the president. Okay. So go home. In summary, go home. Say your prayers. Talk to people. Attack. You know, you got to fronts. You can't quit. Yeah, and we're going to have differences. I'm going to disagree with, with Iron Mike on some things. He'll disagree with me on others. You know, and so on and so forth. That's fine. Check your powder. But I think we got to go after it. We got to go on all fronts. It's got to be an all out attack or we're going to lose the country. And I think Reagan once said, or, or in fact, I think the first person that said Jefferson was, it once, if freedom is ever lost, it's never regained. One final thought for the young people it amazes me how much they'd like a revolution. You know, they're always talking about we want to change stuff, we want, to, we want a revolution. The greatest revolution in the history of man was when they wrote the Declaration of Independence and they codified it by making the Constitution. Never before had men been given the right to practice his rights, to live his rights. It's the greatest revolution in the history of man. Before that, 
There is depotism, tyranny, everything. This is the greatest revolution. So when you talk to the young kids and stuff, you got to remind them, this is the only true revolution that has occurred in 10,000 years. Right here. Anything you want to change goes back to what we had before. And it didn't work. And it won't work. Anyway, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. It's been a great time. You did a great presentation. Last statement. We need a revolution.